Wow, what a phenomenal event. I'm super excited and honored to be here uh, today talking about the possibilities we have with uh, technology. It is um, without question that we're at the dawn of a new era, thanks to technology. There's just so much happening uh, today. And uh, in fact, when we look at what's happening with uh, technology today, it's allowing us to race towards the future in unimaginable ways. Um, earlier this week, Facebook reached a milestone that is indeed really great for all of humanity with one billion users logging on in a single day. That's like having one out of every seven person on the planet logging on to watch the same thing or connecting all at the same time. The technology that we all have in our hands today is really phenomenal. What we do with it and how we shape the future is entirely up to us. What's interesting about all this technology, the internet, and technology that has changed the course of history is that in terms of the capabilities, these technologies are still in their infancy. I say if the internet was just born in the 1990s, it's still a toddler in terms of its capabilities. It's just now learning to walk and run. And now with the emergence of things like virtual reality, we're going to see it do things that we, could, we couldn't even imagine, things way beyond our uh, imaginings. I believe that my life is a simple example of some of the possibilities that we're able to access with technology. I've had some amazing experiences that I could never have dreamed of. Things like sending heat probes into space, looking for intelligent life forms on a NASA project, working with a Boeing company to build a billion dollar technology that changed uh, movie distribution, and more recently, working with the US Department of State as an evangelist for innovation and entrepreneurship. And in my travels, we've spoken or traveled to several countries from Pakistan to Mexico, China, and the list goes on. And no matter where we go, people ask me the same question. How do you leverage technology and what we have today for creating great impact? And my answer is that it's really not rocket science. Truly, it's not even about the technology. It's about the type of principles that we apply to technology. In order to understand how I arrived at this conclusion, I will share my own journey with you and how technology has impacted my life. I was born in Syracuse, New York, to Ghanaian parents. My parents are from Ghana. When I was young, we went back to live in Ghana where I grew up. There were some amazing times, but there were also some really intense moments of unrest. In fact, a defining moment came for me when I was eight years old, and the government was overtaken by military rogues. There were soldiers running the streets. There were friends whose parents were taken away, shot to death by firing squad. There were nights without food, days without food, and then, of course, many nights where we would simply you know, cry ourselves to sleep from hunger. But in the midst of all of this, there was one place that we could escape. Through the power of television technology, we could access the rest of the world. This was a place where we could be provoked to dialogue and be inspired to dream of a new existence and new possibilities for our lives. When I turned 16, I begged my parents to send me back to the US where I knew I would have a better life, the type of life that I had imagined for myself. And they did so at great sacrifice. I remember it, you know, it's almost as if it was yesterday when I came back to the US when I arrived, it was September 29th, 1989. Around 9.39 p.m., we started to make our descent to Charlotte, North Carolina. And I had never seen so many lights. As I looked, as we began to land, I felt like we had truly landed on the moon. This was in uh, North Carolina. Now imagine if I'd been in Las Vegas. It would have been too much. 
So I was a 16-year-old traveling on my own. So I was picked up by friends of my family who lived in South Carolina, where I would finish high school. And they drove me from North Carolina to South Carolina. But during those late night hours, as we drove past things that I had never seen except in movies, what I call bastions of Americana, things like the Red Coke machine at the 7-Eleven. I was very easily impressed back then. <laughs> and some of the tallest buildings I had ever seen, and streets with names of dreamers, Martin Luther King, Lincoln, Edison. It was in that moment that I had this moment thinking all of these things that I was seeing, all these global wonders, had truly started as mere thoughts in people's heads, and that all of life was simply what we truly imagined it to be. I set out to live my own imagination. I've always been a scientist at heart, so before coming to America, I did my research. I watched a movie called Coming to America. <laughs> So, in which Prince Akim, Akim <laughs> goes to New York in search of his queen, goes to Queens, New York. So, the day after graduation, I took the midnight train to New York <laughs> in search of new possibilities and perhaps to run into Prince Akim. <laughs> like Prince Akim, I got a job at McDonald's. I know he worked at McDonald's. <laughs> and I got my first paycheck. When I got my first paycheck, I think it was like $178, I converted it to the Ghanaian money and I was an instant millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> I had never seen that much money, so I went to talk to my boss. I wanted to make sure there hadn't been a mistake. <laughs> so I said, is this all for me? He thought I was complaining. So he said, if you want more money, I'll tell you what. You have to work for it. I just lost the cashier. If you want the job, it's all yours. It comes with a 50 cents an hour pay raise. That's when I learned my first lesson in American business. Don't be afraid to ask for more money, even when you're undeserving. <laughs> so I became a cashier. Becoming a cashier was the best and worst thing that ever happened to me, because I sucked at it. I was the worst cashier ever. <laughs> There was always a long line in front of my cash register. Here I was, New York City, felt like the biggest McDonald's in the world, and I couldn't figure things out. And New Yorkers won their McCoffees and McMuffins, and, and the only thing that stood between them was this foreign moron, which is why they called me. Hey, moron. So after a while, I felt I'd let everybody down. My friends on fries were like, man, you just blew our chances. You know, we're never gonna make it to cashier now. So, and I knew my parents would be disappointed too. Fortunately, redemption came in the form of a commercial I heard while I was up one night. It talked about doing more with your life by 5 a.m. than most people do with their entire lives. I said, whatever it is, sign me up. It was a commercial for the Army. <laughs> so, on my first day off, I went to the Army recruiting office to sign up. When I got there, the army recruiter needed to take a smoke break, so he put me in the hallway. While I was waiting, I looked up and here was this handsome guy with this really big smile, and even bigger biceps, <laughs> working towards me. It was the Air Force recruiter. Needless to say, I ended up joining the Air Force. <laughs> so at 17, your basis of making these lifelong decisions are completely different. People would ask me, why do you join the Air Force? And with conviction, I would say, the recruiter was cuter. <laughs> but it was in the Air Force that I learned about the inner workings of technology. I worked as a satellite technician. So we would go into different places and set up the communications before the troops came in. I ended up in Turkey. And one day, our communications equipment had broken down, and I managed to fix it. And the engineer on duty pulled me aside and said, have you ever thought about becoming an engineer? Up until that time, I honestly didn't even know what engineering was. I didn't know any engineers. 
So I took him up on his word. There was a scholarship that year for the US Air Forces in Europe. I said, what the heck, I'll take a try at it. I applied for that scholarship. There was one scholarship for all the US troops in Europe. And to my surprise, I scored the highest in electronics, math, the whole thing, and I got the scholarship to go back to school. So, thank you. So I went back to Syracuse, um, New York, to study electrical engineering and computer science. And then from there, I continued uh, with my graduate studies in deep, science, uh, deep space science. From there, I say I received my Jedi powers because the world truly opened up to me. <laughs> I had more opportunities than I could imagine. Here I was, I, um, I am, I had designed a satellite that was going to replace another satellite, and I was putting my uh, signature final touches on the rocket before we sent it off uh, into space. Uh, from there, the Boeing company came calling. They had been approached uh, by Lucasfilms to come up with a technology for delivering movies over satellite. I was one of three engineers that was brought in to come up with the technology. Today, I hold most of the uh, ground floor patents for the digital cinema technology, which we deployed uh, with the Boeing company. And today, most movies are delivered digitally using the technology. Star Wars Episode Two was the mo uh, first movie that we uh, distributed. We had to watch that like a thousand times. <laughs> that was a lot of popcorn. <laughs> so from there, I had um, a lot of the movie companies asking me to do different um, projects for them. So I started my own company, Next Galaxy Media. And before you know, I knew it, I was doing work for Claire Channel. Um, you know, LeBron James with Sprite, and, and the list goes on. And today I'm the founder and president of Next Galaxy, which is a virtual reality company. We're focused on education, entertainment, and healthcare. The interesting thing is, as much as technology has played a huge role in my life, what has allowed me to make an impact with technology has been the principles that I learned from my greatest teacher. The Air Force recruiter, no, my dad. <laughs> From my dad. And I'll share some of these core principles with you because they have you know, made a tremendous impact in my own life and the ways in which I have applied technology. I've always been different. And from a young age, my father would always say, have the courage to embrace your difference. Have the courage to embrace your difference. By being a different type of engineer, I was able to create a different type of company. I was able to see things differently. I've always loved art and the sciences, always looking for an opportunity to bring the two together. And Next Galaxy is a creative and a technical company in the sense that we create different types of technology, whether it's for healthcare or for education. By embracing our difference, that's the only way that we're able to find what is truly unique and valuable and different to add to the world and contribute in a significant way. I remember during a lot of the hard times back in Ghana, I would ask my dad, why did we come back? Why did we go back to Ghana? And one day he said to me, my child, I returned to my beloved country to make a difference, to help restore democracy. He also said, because in the final analysis, we will all be remembered for one of two things, the problems that we create and the problems that we solve. Thank you. Thank you. At 12 years old, it didn't mean much to me. But a few years back, when I went back to bury him, and I saw the thousands of people pour in, including the then sitting Democratic government that he had helped put in place, it was about the problems that he had solved for his beloved Ghana that they talked about. <laughs> Service was the cornerstone of his life and it brought him infinite gratification. And today, I look for all different opportunities to apply technology to be of service to others, whether it's working with the hospitals 
or with the West African Foundation, which helps put schools and hospitals in places where there are no schools within 100 miles. Finally, I'll share a story of a young boy, Timmy, in his kindergarten class. The teacher had asked them to draw whatever they wanted to draw. Everyone was done. Timmy was still in the back, drawing. And the teacher said, what are you doing, Timmy? He said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but no one knows what God looks like. He hops up in excitement and says, that means they'll know when I'm done with my picture. <laughs> Today, with technology, we all get to bring out our inner Timmy. We have access to these tools and resources to paint a whole new picture of possibility for our world. What will be unveiled when we're done drawing our picture? What type of future will we paint? How would we use technology to go beyond making cat videos for YouTube? <laughs> As I left to get on the airplane to come to America, I turned around and saw my hero, my father, cry for the first time. And he said to me, my daughter. Yes, Africans are quite dramatic. <laughs> my daughter, my hope for you is to always see our world with a sense of wonder. And my dream for you is to make magic wherever you point your focus. Today, as we talk of emergence and technology, my hope, my dream is the same. That we all continue to see our world with that sense of wonder, that we all make magic wherever we point our focus and our talent. Thank you all so much.